Deepwater is a planet in the vast, on the distant frontier of the galaxy. Though teeming with valuable minerals, its remote location meant it was mostly ignored in the packed worlds. That is, until an intergalactic police force known as the Stewards showed up one day, took over the local government, and began building fortifications across the planet. The fiercely independent people of Deepwater took exception to this, and overthrew the Stewards in a brief but violent revolution funded by a mysterious group calling themselves the Garbage People. Captain William Dean was one of the leaders of that rebellion. A deep water native and thoroughly deep water deep. Deep water through and through. Yeah, exactly. Deep water yeah. deep. He and his brother had spent their youth constructing a starship in a hangar on their family's property. They named it the Crystal Vengeance, and it featured a pinup Cassata drawing on the ship's nose, though, in spite of years of construction, it was far from being spaceworthy. During the revolution, Will had met up with a young looking android named Twill. Twill uh, was a professional uh, vid gamer slash streamer. Twill was caught up in the furor of the rebellion and found himself working as Will's loyal second in command. A female Cassata Solarian named Mira Riata Jersu Jade of Clan Ren, House Bane, seventh of the line of House Jarell, had also joined the rebellion. And though she was assigned to Will's squad, she was less taken with Will. She bristled at his leadership, and they bickered constantly in a curiously persistent way. Mira was headstrong, impulsive, secretive, and dangerous with a Solarian blade. Several months after the steward garrison was overthrown, the stewards returned in force. Will, who was in charge of the beefed-up anti-ship defenses, decided not to launch his missiles as the fleet approached, believing the bloodshed would be too great. There's a lot of reasons why I didn't pull the trigger, but I didn't pull the trigger, okay? And I have to live with that the rest of my life. The stewards landed, crushed the rebellion, and Mira, Twill, and Will fled via an escape tunnel. Will brought the squad back to his home in Red Rock Canyon, intending to flee the planet aboard the unfinished Crystal Vengeance. However, when Mira laid eyes on the scantily clad pinup art and the poorly translated Cassata script, she informed Will that the proper translation was not Crystal Vengeance, but rather Garnet Laser Brash Death. The new name stuck, much to the chagrin of the captain. Surprisingly, there was someone living in the Garnet Laser Brash Death. A bizarre and unpredictable Sheeran mechanic going by the name Xylitol had spent the last few months making the Garnet Laser Brash Death actually spaceworthy. Do you do all of this? Does yeah, it, and other things. Does it, does the ship runs now? Yeah, it totally does. Though in spite of her efforts, it still lacked the expensive drift stones needed to make drift travel possible. After asking around, they learned that a nearby lightly guarded transfer station owned by the Holda Mining Corporation had a handful of drift stones. The crew set about to acquire them. They attempted to sneak into the base, failed, and wound up killing all the guards. They found, much to their surprise, that rather than a few drift stones, the base had a massive storage room filled with the supposedly priceless rocks. But with reinforcements arriving, the crew decided to just blow the place up and bug out. While they were briefly docked at an orbital refueling platform, Mira decided to ditch the crew. She left a note, but it fell behind a garbage can where it stayed for the next several years. The crew had many adventures. At some point, Will hired a Vesk soldier named Nolbava Beck, or Beck for short, as his security officer. Beck was obsessed with earning a good death so he could join his fallen compatriots in the Halls of Glory. All right, I've got to go out into the world and find my honorable death. He also enjoyed journaling, writing poetry, and had an extensive mug collection. Eventually, fate brought the Garnet Laser Rash Death back to deep water. An asteroid mining ship belonging to Holdem Mining Corp named the Riptide had gone missing, and a Lashunta named Shawkan hired Captain Will to go find it. After a brief jump into the drift, the crew arrived at the last known location of the Riptide. They found it disabled and tethered to a very odd-looking asteroid. After boarding, they were immediately attacked by the crew of the mining ship, who had been turned into grotesque zombies. They managed to beat back the attack, messily. Shawkan was incredibly distressed following the fight, and he was picking despondently through the remains of the zombies. When pressed, he revealed to Will that he was not, in fact, working with the Holda Mining Corporation. Rather, his sister Alana was a member of the mining crew, and he'd used his own money to hire the Garnet Laser Brash Death. Luckily, Alana was not among the zombified crew remains, so she might still be alive. They returned power to the ship, but when they did, a haughty voice called out over the intercom. The speaker was named Viceroy Bathard, and he began taunting the crew. Apparently, Bathard had been imprisoned in the asteroid by the Eoxian Bone Sages centuries ago, and he ordered the crew to bring him back to Eox so he could enact his revenge. He invited the crew to come to the asteroid so they could negotiate terms. The crew met with Bathard, 
found Shockhand's sister Alana being held in stasis. There was a brief discussion, followed by a bunch of laser fire and explosions. Bathard fell, and Alana was saved. The Garnet Laser Brash Death returned to Deepwater, towing the Riptide and the unusual asteroid. The Riptide was seized by the government upon arrival, and the Superior Court of Deepwater set about determining which party should receive the salvage rights, a process that could take months or even years. Dismayed at the thought of a protracted illegal battle, Xylitol took things into her own hands and hijacked the Riptide, blasting off into orbit. Unfortunately, the damaged ship did not get far, and it was swiftly overtaken by steward space marines. Xylitol killed several of them with a booby trap and bugged out in an escape pod. Captain Will recovered Xylitol at the crash landing site of the escape pod and gave the crew a stern talking to about sticking together and reaffirming his role as captain. I, I don't know if sometimes we forget, but I'm the captain of this ship, okay? Yeah. I would like from everyone a re-up on your, on your motivations for staying here and for us making money, getting paid, and eventually finding a way to help this planet. Shortly afterward, he got a call from Alana, who seemed to believe that she was being followed. The line cut off suddenly. The crew flew back across deep water to Alana's apartment. Captain Will had a key and had apparently been romantically involved with Alana. Unfortunately, they found her lifeless body in the bedroom, seemingly without a scratch on her. Dismayed at her death, Will began to throw furniture. Beck, in a show of support, also decided to tear the room apart. In the wreckage of the dual fits of rage, the crew found something that shouldn't have been there, a cylindrical device of mysterious origin that had been embedded in the wall. They also found dusty footprints that had the unmistakable tint of dirt from Captain Will's hometown, Red Rock Canyon. As they were leaving, Beck carried Alana out, weekend at Bernie's style. It's funny how I look, Dad, even though I'm alive! Stop! You're drawing attention to us! While Twill hacked the building's security system and found footage of the assassin, who appeared to be a female drow in black clothing, Alana was put into cryo-freeze on the Garnet Laser Brash death. Before heading to Red Rock Canyon, the crew stopped by the Deepwater Starport to try to learn the drow's name. They tried to sneak in, failed, and set off alarms. In the pandemonium, Beck casually and accidentally threatened the ticketing office and managed to secure a passenger manifest with the drow's name. You've misinterpreted oh my, my, my social niceties. Everybody's got their hands up. I simply was wishing to find a common ground by which we could become friends. Uh, that name was Posh Panda. They managed to avoid arrest and headed to Red Rock Canyon. With little else to go on, they headed to a drow enclave in the edge of town, known locally as Drow Town. On the way there, Mira showed up out of the blue. Apparently, over the last few years, she had been working with the stewards as a cultural liaison, or a narc, and she had been tasked with investigating a missing persons case in Red Rock Canyon. Those missing persons turned out to be drow. The matriarch of Drow Town, a woman named Innocent Browncoat, was willing to help the crew find their assassin, but before that, they needed to discover the whereabouts of her family, particularly her son, who had gone missing while exploring a nearby cave. Arriving at the cave, the crew was surprised to see that a massive security door had been recently constructed over the entrance. They knocked and heard a familiar voice of Viceroy Bathard over the intercom. He had somehow resurrected himself and holed up in a hole. Once again, he raised a small army of undead comprised of the missing drow, and once again the crew messily battled through the zombies. They found Innocent Browncoat's son and discovered that he had a pamphlet with an image of an Aslanti Aeon Guardsman that said, Shoot on Sight. This find was disturbing because the Aslanti Empire is a technologically advanced civilization bent on galactic domination. When they invade a planet, they enslave the populace, place them in work camps, and kill those who are not able to endure the forced labor. Could it be that the stewards were on deep water to stave off a possible Aslanti invasion? Unbeknownst to the crew, Mira had actually been sent by the stewards to locate and recruit Bathard. He was a legendary Eoxian Bone Fleet commander and the only person in known history to have faced and defeated a full Aslanti battle fleet. Mira had been sent with strict instructions to either recruit Bathard or retrieve his electrocephalon, which is the device into which he retreated after his physical body had been destroyed. Once again, the crew confronted Bathard. Once again, Bathard was a real prick. And once again, Bathard was defeated in explosive fashion. The crew lugged his charred equipment out to the Garnet Laser Brash Death, hoping that there was an electrocephalon in there somewhere. On the way, they noticed an unexplored passage in the cave. Mira and Will went to investigate, but when Mira saw movement out of the corner of her eye, she attacked. <laughs> now the rock looks down the corridor, goes, and then looks back at the wall. Twilio? Uh, I'd like to take my solar weapon and slash that rock. Okay. Uh, give me an attack roll. Wait. Nope. I didn't, I didn't, you didn't stop me. I'm not stopping you. <laughs> uh, 
Um, oh! Plus minus the alarm one. Oh. <laughs> is that a nat? He has a nat. Nat's um, twenty. It's it's a thirty. And guard no more. Rending a large gash in a small humanoid creature with bizarre mouth tentacles. The creature fell, and Will recognized it as a deep one, a harmless, supposedly mythical creature known for leaving little gifts for the people of Deepwater Deep. Essentially, Mira had just killed a leprechaun. Fortunately, the rest of the crew arrived, and they were able to revive the creature, who was named Very Berry Carey. When the Deep One saw the assembled crew, Very Berry Carey shrieked with excitement. With trembling tentacle hands, she produced a document and read it aloud. It was a prophecy, and it seemed to match the crew's description exactly. If may I read this to you? Yes, yes please, please, and hurry. <laughs> the travelers home come from afar to face furious distant stars. Aboard a ship that cracks and creaks. Which creaks and cracks. Yes, yes, all right, so far so good. The four-armed... <laughs> Vengeful, glittering axe. An aged teen with metal bones. A carefree insect brimmed with drones. <laughs> Their captain, kind but quick to brawl. Hmm. A deadly reptile, swift and tall. Yes, doesn't seem that there's any connection. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry we wasted your time. <laughs> is there more? Yes, there is more. Uh, sorry, I was speed up. It is our nature to speak slowly. <clears throat> Fighting allies, Imperial proxy, snuffed salvation <coughs> from Eoxy. Troubled times and shattered hope, Salvation tribes a knotted rope, a noose to strangle faceless death and squeeze until its final breath. Break them from their rocky tomb or sentence them to certain doom. Break them from their rocky tomb. The South imperiled fighting specters. The West seeks gems from armed collectors. The North shirks back from light encroaching. The East can sense their gods approaching. Four young monarchs, their forebears dead, deceased must come above to slay the beast. One must die, another maimed. The hunters seek the one who's blamed. Impossible love born from disdain. Its heart-shaped, red-hued data chain. A rival returns to settle the score. And yet there is no more. Was that last part part of the poem? <laughs> no, it actually cut off there. Well, it's really <laughs> impressive that you were on. <laughs> Very Barry Carey begged them to come with her to the deep canyons, but they demurred as there were a few loose ends to tie up. The crew returned the body of innocent Browncoat's son, and Beck delivered a surprisingly stirring eulogy. I have good news. Your son has died the honorable death <laughs> many wish would come to them earlier. He is free from this mortal coil and shall be fighting in the great halls beyond. Will, you did nothing? <laughs> that actually wasn't too bad. Yeah. Innocent Browncoat gave her thanks and told the crew that the assassin Posh Panda had visited the Holda Mining Corporation branch office on the outskirts of the city. As the crew prepared to assault the office building, Mira met with her steward handler, a man named Darian. Darian asked her for the electrocephalon, but Mira attempted to negotiate a pardon for the crew. Darian ordered her to hand over the electrocephalon, and Mira decided to pull a gun on her commanding officer. He sees your hands reaching for your pocket, and he goes, Lieutenant, what are you doing? Uh, I'm gonna send one calm text first before I, before, I, uh, before I proceed to shooting him. I'm gonna send it to 12. Help. Okay, he backs away from you. Yeah. And goes, <laughs> Oh, fuck, it's a flare. No, uh, he jetpacks away. He jetpacks away? Mm-hmm. The crew made their way to the office building, tried to sneak in, failed, blew up some security droids, and located the man who had ordered the assassination. He was an executive named the infamous King Cupcake, and he had illegally taken out several insurance policies against the Riptide, naming himself as the beneficiary using shell companies. Now that it had been recovered, his fraud was going to be revealed unless he managed to remove the primary claimant to the ship, Alana. But as he was recounting this to the crew, a mole within the company fired a fatal shot into the executive's head and jetpacked away. The crew found a data pad with info that the assassin Posh Panda was leaving on the morning flight out of deep water. 
They returned to the Garnet Laser Brash death only to be met by a squad of stewards led by Darien. Darien once again demanded the return of the Electrocephalon. The crew handed over Bathard's partially destroyed possessions, which included a chintzy Best Admiral Ever trophy that appeared to be Bathard's Electrocephalon. It was in pieces, and Bathard, the one person who could possibly defend Deepwater against the Aslanti invasion fleet, was now permanently dead. Darien was devastated. He confirmed to the crew that Deepwater is the only known source of drift rock in the galaxy, and that the Aslanti Empire was threatening an invasion. The Aslanti, calling themselves the Garbage People, had funded the rebellion. Without a dependable source of drift rock, billions in the galaxy could die, but without Bathard's leadership and knowledge, the stewards did not believe they could prevent the invasion. To them, Deepwater was lost. Despondent, he told the crew that they were free to go, all except for Xylitol who was to be detained to stand trial for the theft of the Riptide and the murder of the steward space marines. Naturally, Xylitol started throwing grenades. She murdered six of our soldiers. Aha! I'm order. gonna murder one more, let's do this! I Immediately as soon as he said that, it's grenade time, I had to fight. No, 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 you can't stop me, you can fight me, you can fight me for it, you can fight me for it, but you know that it's grenade. And there was a brief firefight, but the steward troopers quickly realized they were outgunned and relented. The crew boarded the Garnet Laser Brash Death, but as they were lifting off, Mira ditched them and rejoined Darien and the stewards, much to the chagrin of the entire crew. Okay, but. Mira doesn't have time for the ship. Mira's gonna get off the ship. <laughs> Wait, what? So what? Mira, Mira, like, wants to save deep water. And, like, she's like, no, if you can't work all together do. right now. But, like, the whole thing is, is that, like, where like, do you think either, we're going? <laughs> either like you sort your shit out right now, or like she gets off and stays with them. Season finale, guys. So once again, mirrorless, the crew headed to Bathard's cave to meet up with Very Barry Carey and head underground to fulfill the prophecy and hopefully save Deepwater from the Atlante invasion. The fate of the planet and perhaps the security of the known universe was in their hands. Join us for this season of Deepwater Deep as we go deeper than ever before.